appreciate them so much. And I hope the Lord will just um, fill their buckets full this week. Amen. And uh, God will touch their heart. Brother Matum, you come and preach to our hearts as the Lord has laid that on, what, on your heart. What if he's laid on your heart, you give us, brother. Amen. Appreciate you preaching. Amen. Well, I tell you, it's the grace of God that enables a woman to sing it as well when you're going through trials, isn't it? It's the grace of God that helps a little 12-year-old boy get up here and sing about Jesus Christ. You know, if every kid in America that age had his attitude, Christopher, we wouldn't need police officers in our schools. And some of our kids wouldn't have to go to alcoholic uh, clinics and drug clinics and sex clinics. They have the same attitude that Christopher had. Also, the gangs would go out of business because they're recruiting kids your age. Kids that love Jesus, they say, no, I wouldn't have any, want to have anything to do with that. But you know, I was thinking about that song as well. That was, song was written out of death and pain. Mr. Stafford wrote that song as he was crossing the ocean. His, his wife and children were on a ship going to England, and the ship sunk. His children drowned. His wife survived. And he followed along from America to England in another ship. And in the area where that ship sunk, the captain said, Mr. Stafford, this is the approximate area where your children drowned. And that is where that song was born. It is well with my soul. And see, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us the grace to be able to say, it is well with my soul. Amen. Well, I hope you like that commercial. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I did not want to preach this message tonight. I wanted to do a fun message. And the Lord just said, no, son, just do what I tell you to do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I was reading the back of the bulletin uh, this morning and uh, about the eagle that stirs the nest to get the youngs out of the nest. And so this is going to be a little bit more of a serious tone message tonight. We're going to stir the nest. And if we can uh, help you, that's what we're going to try to do tonight. If we can help you tonight, you'll get much more out of the meaning this week. And so we're going to deal with the topic for about the next 45 minutes tonight on overcoming a formidable foe. Overcoming a formidable foe. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Help us to put it into practice. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You know, growing up has lots of hills and valleys. We all have encountered many friends in our lifetimes. But we have also faced some foes that have opposed us, people who have tried to ruin our lives. Been in that boat, say amen. amen. Your foes may have been bullies in school or in your neighborhood. For some, your foe may be actually somebody in your family or perhaps somebody at work. Foes come in all sizes and shapes and they show up in many places. You will find, however, that a most formidable foe is with you every day and goes with you everywhere you go. You may ask, what do you mean, preacher? I mean that your formidable foe will frustrate you, the one that will give you the most fits, uh, the one that will cause you to flop, to fail, and falter is you. I'm talking about you. You know, Satan is a fierce enemy. But you are one of your most formidable foes. See, it's our deductions, our conclusions, our interpretations, our assumptions and presumptions that can get us into trouble if they're not based on God's wisdom and truth. Paul addressed this issue here in this portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And he offers some warning and counsel to keep ourselves in check. And we're going to look at verse number 18 tonight. Verse 18 is like a sponge that's full of water, and you got to wring it and wring it and wring it to get the juice out of it. And we're just going to look at the first five words of the verse. It's loaded. 
Let no man deceive himself. One of the most difficult attitudes that pastors face in trying to teach people or reach people for Jesus Christ or help Christians grow in the Lord is the attitude of self-deception. It is difficult to help people who don't think they need help or feel that they are doing nothing wrong. This is why it's hard to help even preachers. Preachers that need help in growth. Preachers that need help in maturing uh, in their lives. Preachers need help too. You know, it's also a struggle to win somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ who does not see his need for Christ at all. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, we think about people who have uh, wrecked their lives or are in the process of ruining them. They really cannot be helped if they are unteachable, if they have made excuses for their sinful actions, or if they are justifying or rationalizing their sinful decisions as reasonable behavior. You know, their, their self-deception, it creates a dilemma for their own lives that are filled with distress, with difficulties, discouragement, depression, and defeat. Paul warns you and me about deceiving ourselves. Jeremiah and Isaiah, they offered the same kind of warning in their writings. They warned us of self-deception and the power of it. Uh, Isaiah said in Isaiah 44, 20, he feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah put it this way in Jeremiah 17, 9. You'll recognize this verse. Mm -hmm. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. Mm -hmm. Because of self-deception, You are a formidable foe to yourself, especially when it comes to the matter of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When a person deceives himself, a number of unpleasant things take place. Awful choices are made. Number two, apathy toward dangerous situations or behavior exists. Number three, admission of faults or weaknesses is ignored. Number four, acknowledgement of problems is disregarded. When a person lives in self-deception, they live as they are not accountable in doing God's will. They are not available. Compromise with evil is acceptable. Worldly heroes are admirable and considered adorable. What is right and wrong is adjustable. Their spiritual growth is abysmal. Living for Christ is abnormal. Apathy and laziness are admissible. Selfishness, sensuality, and unfaithfulness are allowable. The cost for their sin becomes astronomical. But thank God, getting right with God and living for Him is advisable, attainable, and achievable. Amen. All throughout the Scripture, We find people who deceived themselves and they got into major trouble. We're going to look at one guy tonight. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15. This guy is known as King Saul. Saul was a leader who lived in denial and he deceived himself into thinking that all was okay when it wasn't. He disobeyed God. He excused and rationalized his disobedience. 
and he concluded that everything was fine and dandy when it wasn't. Saul rebelled against God's command. Yet he considered his actions proper and obedient to the Lord. And he too got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. What he had. Notice the command of God there in verse number 3. The Lord wanted everything destroyed. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So we see in verse 8 and 9 the contrariness of Saul. Saul did not, want, uh, did not do what he was commanded to do. He disobeyed and he rebelled against the Lord. Verse 8, and he took Agag the king and the Amalekites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag yes, and the best of the sheep and the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile refused that they destroyed utterly. So now we see in verse 13 the conclusion of Saul. Saul believed he had done what God instructed him to do. Look at verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be, be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Hey, I did what I was supposed to do. That's what he's saying here. Not. Nah. Now look at verse 14, the concern of Samuel. Samuel challenges Saul's statement, verse 14. And Samuel said, All right, you did what you were supposed to do. What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? What about all these sheep and oxen? So we see, <clears throat> see the consequences of Saul's disobedience in verse 23. You know, there are always consequences to disobedience, beloved. In Saul's case, it was pretty expensive. He would lose his kingdom. Look at verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. You know, if you go through life thinking that nothing will happen to you if you disobey God's commands, then you are living in denial and deception. You have deceived yourself. <clears throat> A person that deceives himself can create huge problems for himself. Now the question that arises right here is this one. How does this happen? How does a person deceive himself? How does that happen? A person deceives himself by having an improper or faulty view of a number of important issues. By having a distorted view on the following areas that they are governed by faulty conclusions that will affect how they live, what they believe, how they treat other people, and the attitude that they have toward the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are the views? All right, here's view number one. His view of serenity is distorted. A carnal person or an unsafe person <clears throat> that deceives himself, believes he has peace when reality says you don't have peace at all. He deludes himself into thinking that everything is okay when in reality everything is not okay. Deception causes him to not acknowledge the truth of his situation. When this happens, important decisions that need to be made are neglected. People without Christ or people who li whose lives are falling apart, yes, they do this because they do not want to admit their need for God. So they say, oh, everything's just fine. Everything's great. Their deception causes them to put off 
the matter of trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior or to put off the matter of getting their lives right with God when they need to do that and do it today. Amen. A person who has deceived himself says, well, everything's just fine with me. You know, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they spoke about the distorted view of serenity. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Amen. Jeremiah 8, 11, For they have, they have healed the heart, the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Listen, if you're here tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, Tonight, ask him to come into your heart. Stop lying to yourself and thinking that you've got plenty of time to make that decision. Stop lying. And if your life is not right with the Lord tonight, your relationship with God is not what it ought to be, then don't lie to yourself anymore. Get that situation settled tonight. Now, there's a second view, view that's distorted. His view of security is distorted. People that have deceived themselves, they believe they are secure when in reality they are insecure. They trust in things that cannot protect them. They trust in things that cannot save them. And they trust in things that cannot make them happy. You know, the rich farmer in Luke, he thought he was secure for the rest of his life. And he thought he could take it, take it easy and live any way he wanted to live. But he didn't realize just how close death was to him. The conclusions this man made are the same types of mistakes that people make today. They think that their whole life is ahead of them and they have plenty of time to trust in Christ or serve the Lord. They believe there is nothing to worry about when it comes to eternity. Their attitude is, well, I'll serve the Lord later on in my life. Or I'll get saved later on in my life. But sometimes that later doesn't come. You understand that? Yes, sir. And you know what? If that later does come, some folks are just too tired to serve the Lord. And some folks are so scarred by sin, they have just totally trashed their testimony. Now, God can still do something with their life, I believe that, but they're greatly hindered if they have really, really messed up their life. You know, other people live in denial and self-deception for so long that they become hardened by time. And they conclude that they don't need the Lord later on in their life. And uh, when it comes time to really make those decisions, their heart has become like brick. Even in the lives of Christians who say, well, I'll just serve the Lord later on. They too get, Christians get hard. They get hard-hearted too. Sure. Hebrews 3.15 says this, Today if you will hear his voice, harden, not your heart. Did you catch when, the time on that? Yeah. Today. Listen, if there are things in your life that are not right in your life, then tonight get them right. Don't wait till tomorrow. This could be a revolutionary life day in your life tonight. If there's things in your life you need to get straightened out with the Lord. Now, we see a third thing. We, fought, we saw that his view of serenity was distorted. His view of security is distorted. Number three, his view of sin is distorted. John said in 1 John 1, 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Amen. Whether you're a saved person or a lost person, people that have deceived themselves, they believe they have done nothing wrong and they have no sin. They feel that I am just as good as anybody else. Their view of sin is distorted. Uh, what wrongs they have done are rationalized or justified by the wickedness that's in their hearts. Oh, we as sinners, we're real good about excusing ourselves, aren't we? We do that really good. You know, when people excuse or rationalize their sinful behavior, it has a numbing effect 
on their thinking, which in turn leads to more self-deception and more depravity. Their conscience becomes calloused, and it becomes less sensitive to that which is sensual, that which is impure. Thus, they indulge in more evil to satisfy their cravings for evil. Listen, that's the way sin is. What satisfies you today may not satisfy you tomorrow. That's how addictions develop. You've got to have more. When the thrill is gone, you've got to do something that's even more depraved to get that thrill. And what happens, you go spiritually downward. You become entrenched in addictions until the person crashes. They crash emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. That is the nature of sinful addiction. It's a spiral downward until you crash. Titus said in Titus, or Paul said in Titus 1.15, Under the pure all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Yes, sir. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Yes. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.2, he talked about having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The personal evaluations of those who have deceived themselves lead them to conclude that right is wrong. And wrong is right. Or okay. They will justify or excuse that which is sinful and claim they have done nothing wrong at all. Did you know that Solomon described women who believe this way? He said in Proverbs 30, verse 20, Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. Those who have been numbed by their sin are living in self-deception and they will reap the terrible consequences for their choices that they have made. Your sin will eventually find you out. It will catch up with you. You know, Isaiah made that very clear. Isaiah 5.20 Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, there's a fourth view that's distorted. A person who has deceived himself, his view of his specialness or smarts is distorted. Galatians 6, 3, for if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Some folks think they are pretty smart or wise when in reality they're foolish and stupid. People who believe they are smarter than God and they don't need the Lord or the Bible in their lives, they are foolish and they are deceived. They feel they can do a better job at running their own lives better than God. And they don't need anyone telling them what to do. They falsely conclude that they can live in disobedience to God's word and get away with it. No, you never get away with it. They truly believe their way is better than God's way. And such attitudes is what leads to their ruin. Their attitudes many times lead to broken lives, broken families, and broken churches. Because the lifestyle choices that they make end up hurting themselves hurting their spouse, hurting their children, hurting their friends. Solomon warned us of the destructiveness of our arrogance and having a distorted view of our specialness or our smarts. You know, Proverbs 14, 12, he said this, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 26, 12, Seest thou man wise in his own conceit? There's more hope of a fool than of him. Uh-huh. Self-deceived de- self people are gripped 
by the wisdom of this world, which God considers to be foolish. Amen. I never cease to be amazed at people who claim to be smart but are stupid. I tell you what, the thing that just set me off this year was the epitome of, of Nancy Pelosi who said, if you want to find out what's in the health care bill, we'll have to vote on it first. Yeah. Yeah. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard! I don't know if you like Princess Nancy or not, but just... That didn't make any sense to me at all. And these are supposed to be the leaders of our country. No wonder we're in trouble. You know what? These, many of these folks in Washington have snubbed their nose at God, and we're paying for it. There are people who have deceived themselves thinking, we don't need God, we don't need the Bible, we don't need Ten Commandments, we don't need any prayer in our military services, we just don't need God at all. Boy, we're reaping it. You know, people that are deceived, self-deceived, they are duped by their own pride. And if you let your pride keep you from what is right you deceive yourself pride has kept people from putting their faith in jesus christ or getting their lives right with the lord they sense no need to make matters right with the lord or others because they feel they are just as good as someone else or they blame other people for their problems. Have you ever met people like that? They're always blaming everybody else for their trouble. And you know what? They never get any help for their problems because the problem is with them. You know what? Pride will keep you from getting right with your parents, kids. And I dare say there's probably some kids in here tonight, your attitude toward your parents has not been what it ought to be, and you ought to get some things right with your mom and dad. Well, my mom and dad aren't Christians. Better, that's even more important. Amen. If they're not Christians, you ought to be getting some things right with them. Amen. Pride will keep a husband from getting right with his wife. Amen. Listen, man, I wish what I knew now, I wish I knew it 34 years ago when I married my wife. Yeah. You know, we as husbands, we are to treat our wives the same way the Lord treats us. Amen. But many times we don't do that. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. Gentlemen, you ought to be treating your wife like a princess. I ought to love and adore her. Man, I love my wife. Man, I just, I'm just i still crazy about her. She's, she's still fighting me off. Amen. Y'all know what I mean, y'all married folks around here. But uh, I'm still on the honeymoon. I'm still crazy about her. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, it's pretty sad that we as Christian men and women and in our marriages, that we treat our wives or our husbands like some fuddy-duddy. And we ought to adore our spouse because of what Christ has done in our lives. But pride will keep a man from getting right with his wife and going to his wife and saying, would you forgive me for being a jerk? And the same thing is true of a wife. Pride will keep a wife from... From going to her husband and say, would you forgive me for my attitude that I've had towards you? And maybe not being submissive and not being supportive and encouraging to you. Pride will keep us from doing that. Because what we'll do, we'll be saying, well, he did this and he did that and this. And you girls are real good about documenting what we do. He did that and he did that and he did this and this and this. I mean, you're like walking computers. Yeah. <laughs> October 27th, 930 in the morning. Yeah. My wife's like that too. You know, and we're scratching out, how old am I now? And, you know, and trying to remember things. But boy, the wives, boy, they got it down really good. Pride blinds us to our limitations and distorts our ability to reason things out. Pride causes us to blame others for our own mistakes. You know, if you're a pastor here tonight or a pastor listening through the Internet, listen, if your church is full of problems, stop and, and take a look at yourself. Maybe you're the problem. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Now, pride will keep a pastor from doing that. Maybe you're here tonight saying, well, my church is just not what it ought to be. Well, then maybe it's, maybe it's the, not what it ought to be because of you. Yeah. Do you ever think about that? Yeah. Maybe the problem is with you. 
You know, if your church is like everybody else's churches, there's about 20 to 25% of the people that do all the work in the church, and the other 75%, they're sitting on the pews watching it all happen. That's not the way it's supposed to be, beloved. Listen, if you're a part of this church family, if you're going to this church, get involved in the ministry. Stop sitting around watching it all happen and go to your pastor and say, what can I do to help out? Amen. Get in the game. Well, I don't like that kind of preaching. Well, that's Bible preaching. I'm sorry. Our pride can make us cocky and cause us to make costly decisions. It can make us think that we can do anything when in reality we can't. Pride really messes us up. You know, I think, for example, there was a proud, strong, cocky young man at a construction site that was bragging about how he could do everyone at the construction site in feats of strength. He just said, man, I'm just so strong, just bragging about it. He made a, a, a special case of making fun of one of the older workmen on that construction site one day. And after a few minutes, the old timer, the old worker, he'd had enough. He just had enough. And he said, all right, Sonny. He said, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? I'll bet a week's wages that I can haul something in a wheelbarrow over to that building that you won't be able to wheel back. And that young whippersnapper, he said, you're on, old man, come on. Let's bring it on. Oh, yeah. A week's wages, you're on, buddy, you're on. So that old man, that old construction worker, he reached out and he grabbed that wheelbarrow by two handles. And he turned around to that young whippersnapper and he said, all right, son, get in the wheelbarrow. He had him. No way that boy's going to be able to wheel himself back over the other side. So he got a week's wages. But you know what? Pride will get you in trouble. Oh, my. Number five, a person who has deceived himself his view of Scripture is distorted. James 1.22, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The person that has deceived himself has a distorted view of Scripture. You may ask, All right, what do you mean? Okay, what are you talking about? First of all, many self-deceived people, they do not believe that the Bible is true and that the prophecies and the warnings of Scripture do not need to be heeded. Secondly, if you believe that just hearing the Bible preached at church or on television, radio, internet, if you believe that makes you right with God without putting the Word into practice in your own life, you have deceived yourself. You've got to put the Word into practice. James makes it very clear we are to put God's Word into practice in our life. We're not to be hearers only. Now, it's interesting, that word hearers, it comes from the Greek word akrotes. And this word has been used to describe someone who sits in an audience and passively listens to someone who is singing or speaking. This word in our day could be used to describe someone who audits a college class. The auditing student, he listens to the lectures, but he's not responsible for the information that is taught. He is not required to take any test, do any reports, or to turn in any homework. In other words, there is no accountability to the hearing of the lesson. Many Christians today in our Baptist churches, they audit God's Word. They hear it, but they don't do anything with it. Man, what a waste of time. They do not put it into practice in their life. The deceived hearer 
feels he is okay. There's nothing wrong in his life. He ends up being bamboozled by his baloney, double-crossed by his dishonesty, and fooled by his own fairy tales. Listen, beloved, put the Word of God into practice in your life. Put it into practice. Man, when you come to church, the attitude, your attitude ought to be, man, what am I going to learn today? I can't wait to get to church. If I'm, even if I'm not preaching, I can't wait. I'm going to say, oh, man, what, do I, what, what am I going to learn tonight? What can I put into my practice? How can I grow? Man, if you come to church with that attitude saying, Lord, speak to me through my preacher today. Lord, tell me what you're trying to get across to me. I'll tell you what, he'll get across to you. He'll ring your number. He'll call your phone. He'll do it. You know, uh, Martin Luther said, the world does not need a definition of religion as much as it needs a demonstration. And God wants us to demonstrate the truths of Scripture in our life. And you folks that might be here tonight that just sit on the pew, why not start demonstrating what the Lord has done for you and get busy for God? Stop watching everything happen and get busy in this church. Do something. Well, I don't know what to do. Then go to your preacher and ask. Well, he might ask me to do something that's hard. I can't think anything harder than going to the cross. He's worth serving. You know, Andros Tomas is the name officials gave a certain man decades ago in a Russian psychiatric hospital. He had been drafted into the army, but the authorities had mistakenly had and mistaken his native Hungarian language for the gibberish of a lunatic. And they had him committed to a mental hospital. And they forgot about him for 53 years. They forgot about him for 53 years. A few years ago, a psychiatrist at the hospital began to realize what had happened and he helped Tomas recover the memories of who he was and where he came from. Yes. He recently returned home to Budapest as a war hero and the last prisoner of World War II. Not only had this man forgotten his real name, he hadn't even seen his own face in 50 years. There were no mirrors in his room. For hours, when he finally had seen his face after 50 years, for hours, this old man studied his own face in the mirror. The deep set eyes, the gray stubble on his chin, and the deep furrows on his brow characterized his face. But all that was a startling revelation to him. It was all new to him. Imagine looking at your own face in a mirror and not recognizing it. Now, beloved, James said in James 1.22, that is just what people are doing when they listen to God's Word, but they don't obey it. They are right before their eyes in the Scripture is an accurate reflection of themselves. But they don't truly see with their eyes and they don't see with their hearts what the Bible is showing them. Others see themselves from God's perspective, but they do nothing about it, and they end up deceiving themselves. James said in James 1.26, If any man among you seemeth to be religious, and bridleth not his own tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, Amen. this man's religion is vain. That's you know something else that's distorted? His view of sowing and reaping is distorted. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. People who have deceived themselves will not acknowledge that their problems, their troubles, their distress, and their difficulties are sometimes linked 
to the chastisement of the Lord and their sinful choices. They don't want to admit that. The law of sowing and reaping is ignored by them. They may conclude that their trouble is just, oh, this is just bad luck. Yeah. Or this just happens to be a coincidence. Those who have deceived themselves, they refuse to acknowledge their problems are linked with their sin. Because they, they would have to admit, if they did that, they, they would have to admit that they were doing something wrong. The rejection of God's authority makes them more stubborn, rebellious, bitter, and hard-hearted. And this causes them to be more determined to have their own way and refuse to listen to what the Lord has for them. You know, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 5.21, he says this, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without an understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. There are people like that today. They fill our Baptist churches. They refuse to, to deal with their sin in their life. Talk about Christians now. Yeah, that's right. Many Christians are not growing in the Lord because they will not deal with their sin because they have deceived themselves and distorted their view about what sin really is. That's good, that's good, that's good. Not only that, their view of saintliness is distorted. Revelation 3.15 I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that there were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, because thou sayest, here we go, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that there are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? The Laodicean church was a church that lived in self-deception. The whole church was in that situation. They had a distorted view of their sinfulness, believing that nothing was wrong with them at all. They were blinded and deceived by their self-righteousness, not realizing how desperate their true condition was and the way that God viewed them. They were lazy. They were lukewarm. But they considered themselves blessed of God and having much. Now you as a church family, you've got to ask yourself that question tonight. Are we just like the Laodiceans? I threw that same question out to my own church. Are we a church that thinks, man, we're blessed of God and we're just everything's hunky-dory when in reality it may not be? Come on now. These folks thought that all was well and everything was okay, but it was not. And the Lord said, you think you've got so much? He said, you don't have anything. You've got nothing. And that is the, the dilemma of deceiving yourself. You know, Paul gave us a warning in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, there was a young woman. She went to her pastor and she said, Pastor, I have a besetting sin. And I want your help. I come to church on Sunday. And I can't help thinking I am the prettiest girl in the congregation. I know I ought not to think that way. But I, I just can't help it, preacher. I want you to help me with my problem. And the pastor replied, he said, Mary, he said, don't worry about it. In your case, it's not a sin. It's just a horrible mistake. It's a horrible mistake. Now, beloved, there will be many Christians who will stand before Christ one day. They will stand before the Lord and they're going to they're gonna realize they're spiritually broke. Oh, they're saved. But they have no rewards to cast at the feet of Jesus Christ because they haven't done a lick. They haven't done a thing. They just watched it all happen. Just sat in the pew and watched it all happen. They think they're wonderful Christians. They think they have pleased God with their lives, just like the Laodiceans thought. And the Lord said, you don't have anything. Listen, if you need to turn your life around, stop deceiving yourselves if that's what you're doing. Augustine said, before God can deliver us from ourselves, we must undeceive ourselves. Be not deceived! 
Paul's message to us. Be not deceived by the camouflage of corruption and wickedness which make sin look appealing, fun, and exciting without showing you what's under the glamour. Be not deceived about the consequences of corrupt behavior. What might be fun at first may become addictive, agonizing, antagonistic, annihilating, or abide in your life for years. Be not deceived by the concern of carnal people that beg you to join you, to join them in their wickedness. Understand, they are not concerned about you at all, for misery loves company. Be not deceived by condoning or excusing sinful living, rationalizing or excusing your sinfulness will not make matters better for you. You will still feel the sting of your sin. Your guilt will weigh heavy on your mind and you will be accountable for God for your actions. Be not deceived by your cravings for wrong that beg to be fulfilled and try to convince you to indulge in those cravings. Your addictions will cry out, you've got to have it. You've got to do it. You can't live without it. I want to tell you something tonight. It's a lie. Be not deceived. Listen, the Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But you've got to realize that your most formidable foe is you lying to yourself about the situation in your life. So as you look at your life tonight, where are you? Where are you? are you spiritually you've got to deal with yourself nobody else can do it you've got to deal with your own life whether you're a child teenager a mom and dad or grandma and grandpa tonight you've got to deal with yourself and the best thing you can do is stop deceiving yourself stop lying to yourself get honest with God and say Lord here's where I'm at spiritually here's what I need to get right in my life and here's where what I want to go this is what I want to do for you and I'll tell you what when a whole church does that you got a revival breaking out Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the evening. Lord, help us to not deceive ourselves. Help us to realize that our most formidable foe is us. And Lord, we pray as we contemplate this message tonight. There are folks, as they look at their lives, there's some things they need to get right with you. Lord, I pray they'll do that tonight in this service. And Lord, if there are folks that need to be saved, I pray they'll come to know Christ tonight and ask Jesus to come to their heart. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I know the Lord is my Savior. Jesus is in my heart. But as I look at my life tonight, I realize in some areas of my life, I've been deceiving myself. And there's some things I need to get right in my life with God. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a husband and you need to go to your wife and say, Would you forgive me for some things that you've done? Maybe, ladies, you need to go to your husband and seek forgiveness. Maybe some of you kids need to ask your parents to forgive you for attitudes and stuff that you've done toward them. Stop lying to yourself. If there's some things in your life that need to be corrected, then correct them. That's called putting God's word into practice. Maybe you heard a night say, Preacher, I'm a Christian, and that's what I need to do tonight. There's some things I need to get right in my life, and I'm putting the brakes on self-deception tonight. It's going to end tonight. I'm getting things settled with the Lord in my life. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand while nobody's looking? I'll pray for you. There's some things I need to get right with God. Pray for me. Yes, God bless you. I see those hands. Good. Those are good decisions. Good, 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 good. Many hands. Pray for me. There's some things I need to get right with the Lord. Pray for me. Pray for me. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor... If I die tonight, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I need to ask Jesus Christ to come to my heart and be my Savior. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? I'll pray for you. I need the Lord. Pray for me. Pray for me. All right, Father, we pray for these folks tonight as the pastor comes up to the platform and takes this invitation. Father, I pray there are folks that need to make decisions tonight. They'll do so. May they they be yielded to you in their lives. May they not deceive themselves anymore. May they let the Lord have his way. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.